we learned from the condensed matter theorist that uh, what the continuum limit really means for us is that the momentum cutoff, momentum cutoff is very high. And by this, we actually mean that the short distance physics or high energy physics is very well separated from the low energy physics. So for example, you, have, you want to compute something in such a way that the momentum cutoff divided by the Higgs mass is very large, okay? And as I said, what you compute is actually the line spacing A times the Higgs mass, and we want this to be very small, very small, okay? And in the language of the um, condensed model physics, we're actually just looking for uh, the second order phase transition, okay? Because that's the, uh, the point where the low and typical long distance physics as characterized by the uh, correlation length C divided by your lattice spacing will diverge. Okay? And what's more is that such phase transitions we are trying to find are not induced by finite temperature effects. Okay? You write down a field theory and then you just go and scan your fair parameter spaces and you want to look for non-thermal second order phase transition points and that's where you define your continuum limit. Okay, so this is a comparison with what condensed model physicists are trying to achieve. They're trying to tune their system in such a way that a fixed lattice spacing and their correlation will diverge, but for our purpose, we are saying that we have some fixed uh, length scale, like the inverse of the uh, like Compton, the, the, the Compton wave lens of the Higgs mass, uh, of the Higgs particle, which is the typical uh, fixed uh, long distance uh, wavelengths, and then uh, in this limit, we can take a lot of space in zero. Okay? So this clear? All right. Okay, so let me just uh, then show you quickly um, uh, in plot uh, about the story I told you. Um, so this is uh, this is typically what happens when you when, when you try to uh, scan your bare parameter space and look for uh, the corners where the uh, lattice spacing is very small compared to the long distance physics. So in this theory, we can actually use the uh, uh, scalar vacuum expectation value because we know that uh, the scalar vacuum or a vacuum expectation value is a good order parameter characterize your uh, phase transitions in this system. And the plots I'm showing you were actually prepared at uh, infinite fair quartic coupling. Okay. And uh, also a fixed hopping parameter in the scalar sense. And then I just scanned the bear uh, Yukawa coupling here. And then you see that uh, the vacuum expectation value would actually go from uh, some non-zero value to a zero value here at different lattice volume. And for the condensed matter theories, we know very well that this alone only tells you that uh, there's a phase transition, but then be sure that you're actually dealing with a second order phase transition such that you have large separation scales, you will have to look at a scaling behavior, and in particular, you could actually look at the uh, uh, susceptibility. And then you see, uh, by studying the finite size scaling behavior of the susceptibility, we can confirm that this is a second order phase transition. Okay? If you have not seen this before, you have to trust me that this is actually the scaling behavior of the uh, susceptibility that the second order phase transition and then, of course, this to be meticulous, you should actually go and reconstruct your scaling plots. Okay, that means uh, you know that the scaling means that if you actually plot this with not with the uh, couplings but with some uh, scaling variable, they sh this, all these data points should, write, should lie on a single curve. And this is indeed proof that you're seeing. So this is what we will have to go through to identify our, um, our continuum limit. 
Okay? And you see how many simulations you have to do. A lot of simulations will have to enter this game just to know where you stand and to start doing interesting work after this. And once you identify that uh, you are in, in this regime of the parameter space, you are very, very close to the uh, uh, continuum limit. What you have to do is that uh, you, will, you will not want to s perform the lattice simulations precisely at the continuum limit, because you know that if you do it, first of all, the lattice spacing is really zero, and then no matter how many points you, you have to design your lattice, the, the volume is going to be shrunk to zero, and that's not good. And also, you know that uh, the, the renormalized couplings will be very, very small, okay, very close to zero, and that's perhaps not good for, you know, for matching your theory to, reali to realistic low energy effective theory as well. So you would like to come out a little bit from the continuum limit and keep your lattice space non zero, but very small. I'm sorry. Uh, on those, in those calculations, is the volume the only thing that's changed? No, 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 no. The the color coupling. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So each data point is one simulation. <laughs> right, right. So you see, this is a uh, plot. For this plot, I mean about a hundred simulations already. Right. So in the last plot, plot, what is the what is the x axis? Uh, this is the scaling uh, scaling variable you can reconstruct from from knowing this. Okay. So the scaling variable It's a function of y. It's a function of y. This is actually a okay. So so around here you can determine your critical value of y. Right? That's where the, the phase transition really happens in infinite volume, that you can fit. And P is just Y minus critical value of Y. And this is the volume. And what's new? New is the critical exponent. Okay. And I mean, you can show, you can de easily derive this using the technical minimization rule that this is the, uh, this is the scaling variable. Okay, so that actually finished the story that I wanted to, sh to, to tell you about uh, the uh, the basics of the uh, of the uh, of the strategy for conducting the lattice simulations for for the uh, Higgs-Yukawa model. And after this, you can start, you know, determining where you want to spend more computer resources and uh, spend more manpower in analyzing and generating and analyzing your data. Okay, but as Jingwei was asking, how many simulations are there here? And I said it's about 100, so it's really expensive. But, and also, if you, if you don't have a clue at all where to start, it's probably not just 100 simulations that you have to do, or you have to do thousands of simulations, and that's super expensive. So how do we know, roughly, that this could be the corner? This could be a potentially interesting corner that we want to uh, start looking for a continuum limit. The answer is uh, we have some analytic tool to help us. It's called the uh, constraint effective potential. Okay, let me be quick on this uh, this slide. Then. So, first of all, as I said, the phase structure of the Higgs-Yukawa model is actually uh, proved by using a scalar vacuum expectation value. And on the lattice, because of uh, uh, technical issues, we define it as uh, something which I call the magnetization, which is listed here. And these are just the, uh, the average of the scale, the modulus of the scalar field. Okay? Or the modulus of the average scalar field on the entire lattice, and you compute the vacuum expectation value, or ensemble average of that. And V is just the, the, uh, the, the four volume you have in your system. And the constraint effective potential is defined in this way. So what you do is that you can, you put in a delta function here in your partition function. Without, it, without this delta function, it's just a partition function of the Higgs-Yukawa model, where this action is just 
this as the hexagonal uh, theory action. And you constrain this, the zero mode of the scalar field, or the Higgs field, to be a particular number, or not a particular number, to be something that I call phi c. Okay? And then that's it. And then you do your calculation of the uh, partition function. And uh, you say that this is proportional to exponential minus four volume times the potential that's defined this way. And what's this? You see, you are doing the entire path integral except for the zero mode. So you're not summing over the zero mode of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Higgs fail. And that means you're actually just, just computing the distribution of the zero mode of the Higgs field in this part of the world. That's it. So in other words, you can actually compute it numerically by looking at the distribution of the, uh, of the zero mode of the Higgs field. Okay? Or if you follow this prescription, you can actually perform perturbative calculations to extract this uh, effective potential. And what's more, you can show, and it was shown by these two gentlemen 30 years ago, that uh, if you take the infinite volume limits of the system, this constraint effective potential will be identical to the effective potential that you study in your common field theory textbook, which is just the Dijonda transform that we are connected to, which is functional. Okay, these two are identical to the infinite volume limit as shown by these guys. So what's good is that you can actually do analytic calculations and you can also do numerical um, computations for this effective potential. I will show you some plots in the next few slides here. Okay? Now, I will just use this, uh, these tools to tell you a story about what we are doing uh, in the Higgs uh, Yukawa uh, model. So, um, the project I'm going to present you is still ongoing. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's quite interesting. So I'll tell you what uh, we have achieved. Uh, what we are still doing. Okay, so I take the uh, Higgs and Core model that I wrote down on this very scary uh, slot number one of the tool, and I ask myself, what if I add a dimension six operator of this kind to the model? Okay. So you know that this dimension six is uh, dimension two power. Okay, and then you're going to tell me, ah, look, I mean, I know my effective field theory. So um, I know my quantum field theory. Uh, first of all, this is not renormalizable. And secondly, you know, okay, I mean, you can say we live in the 21st century. You know, uh, Ken Wilson told us, why do you care about renormalizability anymore these days? So yeah, go free to add this. But if you really um, remove the cutoff scale in your theory, then this guy goes to zero anyway. It's a country field. But that's precisely the point. The point is that. Uh, if you, re if you really push your color scale to infinity, not just this coupling will be zero, all the couplings will be zero because this is supposed to be a, a trivial thing. So in other words, if you would like to treat this uh, hexacola model as a defective field theory, then you can ask yourself, by including this dimension six operator, is it possible that uh, some cut of scale, okay, and that cut of scale it's finite, but we can actually have uh, viable uh, low energy uh, physics predictions from my model, from my effective theory, such that this model, uh, such that this operator can actually play a role in some phenomenology that we want to do. So what kind of phenomenology we want to do? The phenomenology we, we want to do is the thermal phase transition. Okay? In other words, I'm pretty sure many people in this room know that. Uh, um, in order to, in order to uh, have this uh, Sakharov's uh, criteria in biogenesis, uh, which is electroweak interactions, uh, we need to have first order phase transition in the electroweak sector. Okay? And with just a Higgs and Yukawa uh, theory, it's actually very difficult to generate first order phase transition. Okay? Because the scalar sector. Right now, in the standard model, stops at uh, the quotient coupling. Okay, and if you think of this scalar sector of the, uh, uh, of the standard model in terms of your Landau-Ginzburg uh, effective theory that you learn about in critical phenomena, 
And then you know immediately there is no way you can generate first order phase transition. Okay? At least in the mean However, if you add dimensional six operator, then it's possible that uh, in the lab of Ginsburg theory that you have uh, tricritical points and you have first order phases which are coming up there. So that's the idea. Okay. So now, so what we want to do is the following. Again, we will have to perform a scanning in the uh, bare parameter space, and then we say. We still want to get close to second order non thermal phase transitions because those are the points where we can define our continuum limit. And we want to stay close to our continuum limit because we want our cutoff scale still high enough, although not infinity. Okay? And this is characterized by this statement here that uh, A times the Higgs VEF, in other words, the VEF of the Higgs divided by the cutoff is much smaller than 1. And also, another thing is that uh, these days we also know from experiments that the Higgs mass is 125 GeV, and we also know that the Higgs bed actually plays the role in giving the mass to the W and Z bosons. So we know from experiments that uh, this ratio between the Higgs mass and the Higgs uh, between the Higgs bed and the Higgs mass should come out to be about the same. As to, so it should come out to be about two. So in other words, we want to find our, we want to tune our beta couplings in such in such a way that these conditions are satisfied, and we want to look for first order phase transition when we heat up the system. Okay. So this is not a trivial uh, task, as I will show you. Uh, do you want to have a, a large correlation length and first order at the same time? Yes, but but there are different phase transitions. So the large large correlation length means second order phase transition, right? right? But that is a bulk phase transition. In other words, that that is a non-thermal phase transition, right? And and then near this phase transition, we start doing thermal field theory. And in thermal field theory, we want a first order phase transition. And not just that, we want to have this condition as well. Like otherwise, it's not a viable model. So this is not a trivial task. But if we can find this, you know, it will be very interesting. Okay, just to prove that, uh, you know, by including this very simple uh, operator that I wrote down here as a prototype of physics beyond the standard model, we can actually generate uh, first order thermal phase transition in the electronic sector. Okay, so this is, uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, little project. So, so how do we go about to look for these? Okay. So as I said, we actually rely on you know, constraint effective potential and uh, this is an example which shows you something that is, uh, you know, very close to the endpoint of uh, first order phase transition. In other words, you do your simulation, and this is the Higgs bef that you measure from your simulation, and this is uh, the uh, Markov chain steps that you do, uh, that, that you record in your um, <coughs> in your Monte Carlo your Monte Carlo calculation, and then you see clearly that uh, uh, in this kappa value, in this pair coupling, uh, the Higgs bef stays roughly the same here, and uh, the magenta is here, uh, but the green one, you see a two-state behavior. So this is a bit like hysteresis that you study in condensed matter physics, and looking for uh, first order phase transition, and then if you just do the histogramming and computes. Well, this is the, you can just look at the uh, distribution of this this Higgs web here and compute the constraint effective potential numerically, as I introduced a few minutes ago. And these are the shapes of the effective potentials. And you see, in particular, that in this uh, for this red red curve, you can see that something is coming down here, 
And this is a typical thing which will happen when the system is undergoing a first order phase transition. So these are actually the tools that we will use to identify the, uh, the phase transitions. And then of course, if you are seeing a second order phase transition, you should see a very gradual change. Okay, instead of such a rapid tunneling or semi rapid tunneling, you should see some some gradual change and that signifies large upper correlation time. And also when you plot the, the potential, you should see that the potential will just broaden. Okay, which is a typical case for the second order phase transition. Okay, so then the results for our scanning of the uh, non-thermal phase transition is this. I'm sorry, the previous slide is for thermal or non -thermal? This is This is, uh, this is non-thermal. Okay. Then how do you see to no Sorry? Oh, okay. You, you change the coupling, the effective potential changes. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so that means the system is undergoing some first, first order phase transition. Mm -hmm. And so the plot I showed you on the previous slide Let's actually get a simulation done, I believe, around here. So you're actually, this is kappa, right? So you're actually going like this way, across this line. So that's why you see the, the change of the potential that way. Okay? So we actually did a lot of scanning for this system. And these are the, uh, these are the uh, phase structures that we mapped out for these two choices of number six. And the y-axis here is the cortic bare cortic coupling, and the oh sorry, the x-axis here is the bare cortic coupling, and the y-axis here is the hopping parameter of the scalar bare. So you see that uh, the blue line here, for example, is actually a uh, line of second order phase transition, or this point of second order phase transition, and this red line is uh, the line of, sec uh, of first order phase. Transition. What's more is that uh, here, this part of the phase diagram is the symmetric phase, while here you have the broken phase. So in order to do our simulation, remember, we do want to have a vector from Higgs, right? otherwise you don't have a spectrum tool. So, and also you want to get closer, you want to get close to the second order phase transition here, because this is non thermal so you would like to simulate somewhere here in the broken phase, but quite close to this bit, this this, uh, this blue line. Okay, and it's here that we want to do an extensive extensive study to identify first order phase uh, first order thermal phase transition, and to test if the model could actually produce the low energy phenomenology correctly. So let me show you something we did. Can I have like three minutes, three to five minutes? Yeah, and then, then, then I finish. Let me show you what we did, okay? So this is uh, the choice of the bare parameter that we, uh, that we study. Okay, this is uh, the number six, and this is the uh, quarter coupling, and the Yukawa coupling is tuned this way, and First of all, you see all these little blue thing here, okay? And this blue curve is actually uh, composed of many uh, constraint effective potential calculation and perturbation. And the couplings here are pretty small. So you see that the result of the constraint effective potential in perturbation theory largely agree with the red points, which are simulation points. Okay, the red points are really what we did in the Monte Carlo simulation. And not just that, we also did uh, several others just to change, change the, uh, the volume here to show that the finite size effects are actually under control. And so we did all the tests and we make sure that this is actually a third, second order phase transition. Okay, and this is non thermal. And now you see. These are green dots and magenta dots. The temporal directions in these simulations are a lot smaller. That means you shorten the temporal direction, and that's, a, that's the typical way you do finite, uh, finite temperature uh, thermal field figuring. So in other words, if you do this, 
here, we're actually looking into uh, finite temperature phase transition. Okay? And so we found... What's the uh, x-axis? The x-axis is the kappa. Okay, you, it, it's just the, uh, the Bayer parameter. You change the Bayer parameter. And of course, this just means you change the Bayer parameter, the temperature is changing. Right? Because the number, of, the number of points you have in the temporal direction is fixed. But you change the Bayer parameter, and the lattice spacing is changing, so the physical length of the temporal direction is actually changing as well. And that means temperature is changing. So, so here we're doing thermal field theory, and, and you see that it's, it looks like a first order phase transition. And we looked at the effective potential and so on, and it is actually a first order phase transition. So this could happen. You see, you have a second order non thermal phase transition, but you have first order thermal phase transition. This can happen. However, this plot is not good because if you compute this ratio of the Higgs bed divided by the Higgs mass, okay, then you get this uh, this blue, this dark blue thing, okay, and this is actually from the constraint effective potential calculation, but the simulation results are roughly the same as well, so I'm not plotting them, and you see that it turned out to be very high, okay, and experimentally we know that it should be two, so in other words, although we have, we've actually succeed. We've actually succeeded in finding the uh, correct phase transition patterns that we were looking for in order to try to explain the electroweak biogenesis in, the, in, in this model. This is not phenomenologically viable. Okay? It's ruled out by experiments. It's not good. Okay? So I'll leave this as an exercise that uh, we will think about to do, to actually lower this you will have to look for the corners of the parameter space such that these two couplings become stronger. Okay? If you go home and plot the, how the potentials will change and how it relates the uh, bottoms, uh, the uh, ground state of the potential and the curves and the curvature as the uh, phenomenological uh, quantities, you understand what I'm saying. You have to tune up these uh, coupling constants to make this uh, ratio a bit lower. And that's what we are doing now. Okay. So now let me show you this. Again, if you look at this, okay, this is the um, this is the uh, non-thermal phase transition. Okay. And uh, all these things were actually obtained using perturbation theory in the uh, analytical work on the constraint effective potential. Um, you can also do this for the uh, thermal phase transition as represented by the green dots here. And you see that uh, you have the correct thing that you're looking for, second order non-thermal, first order thermal. And what's for is that the ratio between the BEV and the Higgs mass turns out to be roughly 10, okay? We're not asking for high precision here, so if, if we have something that's within 30 or even 50% of what happened. And you see that this is the change of the effective potential when you go across different uh, bare couplings in the, uh, in the thermal field theory, you see a two, a two state, although it's pretty shallow, okay? And this is the, uh, non-thermal case. All right, so this looks pretty good, but this is, this is actually done using analytic calculations, and that relies a bit on the, uh, on the perturbative expansion. So it's better that we check this against the data, against the truly non-perturbative calculations numerically with the uh, lattice simulations. And so this is the result. You see exactly the same choice of the uh, of the couplings, and uh, the red dots are the largest results, okay, numerical results for the non-thermal phase transition. And remember, we wanted to have non-thermal phase transition at second order in such a way that we can define our continuum limit. But and from analytic calculation using perturbation.